And so what I thought I would like to do, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak, I, I want to thank Ira for inviting me and Joel McCower for inviting me, uh, is to talk a little bit about this issue of water and the way it's related to uh, the whole clean tech industry, the way it's related to the whole issue of sustainability. Uh, I come out of the energy world a long time ago, the way it's related to energy. Uh, there are are very strong connections between energy and water, and water and energy. On the other side, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'm going to also talk about this issue of peak water uh, and what that might mean, uh, how it might be relevant, how it might not be relevant to the discussion that I think we're all having. So I'm going to talk about the water crisis. What is it? Uh, to give you some sense of the challenges that we face in the water world. I'm going to talk about peak water and whether it makes any sense to talk about peak water. I'm going to talk about business risks associated with water. Uh, there are many ways in which I think the business world and industry sectors face a series of growing challenges associated with availability, quality, access to fresh water. The other side of that is opportunities, and many of you are interested, I think, in opportunities in the water space. Uh, and there are such opportunities, although I think they might be a little bit different than you expect, and I'm going to talk about some of those. And then I'm going to talk about solutions for the coming century. So first, what is the water crisis? Is there a water crisis? Uh, I'm going to argue that there is. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the water crisis. But I do want to give you a little bit of a sense of the nature of some of the challenges that we face in the water world. Because if we understand the nature of those challenges, we have an opportunity perhaps to understand the nature of some of the solutions that might be available. In my mind, the most significant failure globally in the water world is the failure to meet basic human needs for water. There are a billion people on the planet that don't have access to safe drinking water. There are probably two and a half billion people on the planet, that's 40% or more of the world's population, that do not have access to adequate sanitation services, something all of us take completely for granted. And that failure to meet basic human needs for water is, in my mind, the worst part of the global water crisis. It leads to hundreds of millions of cases of water-related diseases every year. It leads to two million or so preventable deaths from water-related diseases, cholera, dysentery, schistosomiasis, guinea worm, a, a whole series of things that if you don't have access to safe water, you suffer from. And that's a crisis and it's an opportunity. We know how to provide safe water and sanitation for everyone. We've just failed to do it. There is local water scarcity and resource depletion. There are parts of the planet that are drier than others. The hydrologic cycle delivers water. It's a renewable cycle from one part of the planet to another on a regular basis, but it does so unevenly. And so the uneven distribution of water in space and time is a fundamental characteristic of the water cycle. There are wet places on the planet and there are dry places on the planet. And so there are local problems with scarcity, there are local problems with resource depletion, and I'll come back and talk a little more about some of those as well. But that maldistribution of water in space and time is a fundamental characteristic that we have to deal with technologically and economically and politically. There is water contamination. Water quantity is a problem, but water quality is a problem as well. Industrial wastes, Human wastes contaminate much of the water that we already have. And so, to some degree, the water quantity problem and scarcity is often a contamination problem as well. It may be that we have plenty of water, but that it's of the wrong quality for the things we need. So, think about quality and quantity together. Climate change is a real problem. Climate change is occurring. It's occurring because of human activities. This is an audience I probably don't have to make that argument for, but there are still such audiences on, around. Uh, and the hydrologic cycle, evaporation, the formation of clouds, condensation, precipitation, runoff, that's the hydrologic cycle that you all remember vividly from your second grade class. That is the climate cycle. 
As the climate changes, our water resources will also be affected. Where it rains, when it rains, how much it rains, evaporation, demand for water, that's going to be affected and is already being affected as the climate begins to change. And so we need to integrate climate change into our thinking about water resources, and we're not good at that either, in part because water managers are trained to assume that the future climate's going to look like the past. And there's variability, there are floods and droughts, but the future's going to look like the past. And if there's anything that the climate community is telling us, it's that's no longer true. Water is fundamentally involved in everything we care about. The production of energy, the production of food, the production of semiconductors, goods and services require water. Different amounts of water in different places at different times, but as we continue to produce the goods and services that we need, it's past time that we started to think about the water implications of that production. And a growing number of companies are now interested in how much water is required to do the things they need to do. Ecosystems also require water, typically the same water that we humans take out for human use. And so increasingly, we see ecosystem destruction as a result of human withdrawals of water. And conversely, we see policies designed to try for the first time to think about, all right, maybe we ought to be restoring ecosystems that we've damaged. Maybe we ought to be restoring water that humans have previously taken back to the environment, to the rivers, to the lakes, to wetlands, and so on. And so integrating ecosystems into the water question is a key part of the equation. And so the water crisis is a lot of different things. There's a human dimension, there's an ecological dimension, there's a political dimension, there's an industrial dimension, and thinking about these things in an integrated way is something we're not very good at, as you all know from the energy world, uh, but it's going to be critical to clean, sustainable, a clean, sustainable world moving forward. So that's the world water crisis in a nutshell. It's hugely complicated. There are lots of pieces to this. I'm not gonna dwell on it anymore. Just understand there are a lot of components to it and we're not very good about thinking about them in an integrated way. Ah, I left this out and I shouldn't have. Water and politics are integrated as well. Half of the land area of the world is in what's called an international river basin. Rain falls, it runs off in a river. Half the land area of that river is shared by two or more countries. Water and politics uh, the history of water and politics and the history of conflicts over water goes back 5,000 years. One of the things we do at the Pacific Institute, which is a research and policy institute in Oakland, is we, have, we track water and conflict. We have online a water conflict chronology, for those of you who like history, that goes back 5,000 years with examples of conflicts over water resources, where water was a source of conflict or a tool of conflict or a target of conflicts that may have started for another reason. But water and conflict have a long history. And so if we don't think about water in the political dimension either, if we don't think about the way water and conflict are related, uh, we're going to worsen our problems, not lessen them. And that's a whole separate talk, as you might imagine. Okay, peak water. Uh, lots of you may have thought about peak oil, heard about peak oil, read about peak oil. It's, it's an interesting idea, it's a controversial idea. But uh, I'm gonna talk about peak water and what it may or may not mean. And I'm gonna try and do it in three easy shapes. Here's the first one. This is the curve that many of us deal with all the time. It's the classic exponential curve. Economists love to see it, especially if it's your portfolio, you love to see it. Uh, it's, just, it's just exponential growth. 